It is Friday, November 23rd, 2018. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And it was a very, very fun and very, very educational get your ass kicked at Jiu Jitsu Friday. You know, just like crypto markets, we can't afford to be taking any time off, or at least no serious time off of our jiu-jitsu learning and today was very very special indeed um i felt especially uh, felt like an especially large idiot um you know bigger than i normally do which which is kind of a kind of a surprise for me at least um but nonetheless it was very educational and very fun and what made it so educational and so fun and what made me feel so absolutely utterly stupid on the mat was the fact that I was getting to roll with a um, one of our instructors, one of the head instructors of the school, and uh, I actually got in uh, close to two five-minute rounds, two complete five-minute rounds with them. I had to cardio tap a couple times. I'm not. I'm not going to even lie, um, but it, it was it was educational because he was going through step by step. It's like you know he and he would pause to see where I was going with it, right? And so as soon as I would move. He would let me get like most of the way through it, and then he would transition to something I know for a fact we spent time drilling in class. Every single thing he applied on me, I know for a fact we, we, did, we did time in class on. So it was like a, a flashback of classes, and you know it, it showed me a couple things that, that I really, 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 really need to work on. And I had this really bad habit of letting myself get flattened out, and uh, he was he was really stressing that you know get up on your side, get get up on your hip, you know get up on your elbow, you know, but don't don't be flat on your back because there's just too many options you provide for your opponent that way. And, and he was very very correct, and, and uh, of course he was correct. He's a fucking black belt instructor, got his black belt from people that in Brazil and shit. Anyway, continuing on. Uh, so like I said, it was very, very educational. And plus, I got to work this really, really neat way to an arm bar today. And uh, I, I I, feel like if I um, if I were to spend enough enough time on it, that, that that would definitely be one of my default ways to be getting people into that arm bar. Because... My, my tendency is to push for side control, you know, top side side control, um, and then try and transition to full mountain, so on and so forth. But anyway, my, my tendency is to lock, lock down that, that uh, top half guard, or not half guard, but um, top side, side control, really. And uh, just, just concentrating on maintaining control there. And so having a nice, easy way to transition into a... Uh, a submission there, I I, I think would be very very good for me. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I got to got to work that quite a bit, and uh, I I think that's one that I I might actually <laughs> end up getting on somebody if I'm if I'm able to set it up right. There there were a couple glitches in the way that I was trying to set it up, but I I think I found one way around my my lazy nature with with regard to maintaining the uh, pressure on my opponent and uh, being able to slide the leg up under their shoulder and uh, get get both both knees really really tight around their leg and stretching it out uh, but anyway yeah like I said very very fun very very educational um but, uh, yeah I it, it was an all-around great class I it, it was no open mat because we didn't actually have a instructor per se um but there was there was a lot of guys working stuff in there so it was it was good that you know had a, had a little bit of diversity and had opportunities to roll with different people but uh specifically getting to roll with one of my instructors man that was just that was really really cool i mean because it, it was on the verge of being like a like a private lesson because it didn't seem like anybody else was all that eager to roll with him and uh, he, he's like, hey, you want to roll? I'm like, fuck yeah, I want to roll. <laughs> so, yeah, I um, I wish I would have had a, a little better, like, mindset as far as what I wanted to work specifically with that open mat. Because, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, given the time that we had available, that I probably could have found something that I really needed to, to work on. And, and I think I did 
you know, inadvertently with, with the instructor. So, uh, yeah, it was, like I said, altogether good, fun, open map session. And, uh, yeah, I think I'll be, uh, I think I might actually go back in tomorrow just to drill, if nothing more. You know, I, I've been feeling the need to expand my attendance at least by one more day, you know, getting in four solid days a week instead of just three. Um, I, I feel like it's it's giving me a little more uh, connectivity to it, you know. Um, I, I'm a little nervous about getting up to five days because every time I get up to five days, what happens is it goes great for like two weeks. And then, like, the, the tiredness or whatever, I, I didn't make an adjustment in the rest of my schedule, you know, whether it be sleeping or eating or whatever, and I end up getting hurt, and then it takes me out for another two months, <laughs> and I got to work back to it, you know, and, and uh, I, I just, I don't have any real patience for being injured, you know, and I, I found out one little trick, though. If you if you are significantly injured, I mean, to the point that you really, really can't roll with somebody else. It's not that you don't want to roll with somebody. It's that you really can't because invariably, you know, your your ankle or your knee or whatever it is that's hurt keeps getting hurt, you know. Uh, when, that, when that happens, don't stop going to class. I, I found this out the hard way that the, the best way to go about it is still attend class, do whatever warm-ups you can do, you know, and if you can't do the warm up that they're doing, do something else instead that you can do. Like, you know, if it's if it's something with your shoulder and every time you do shoulder rolls on it it hurts, right? When they do shoulder rolls, do another set of, of shrimps or something like that. But don't stop moving. You know, and then while they're they're drilling, either drill the thing that they're drilling if you can, but if you cannot, step off to the side, do some sit ups, do some push ups. Do something that you can do instead, just trying to keep your heart rate up, right? And that, that way, when you are coming back, a lot of times you're going to find yourself actually stronger on the mat if you do allow yourself that time to heal as well as continuing your practice. I mean, because I, I always found out that, like, if I did take any time away from the gym, like, you know, I just I didn't go there, right? I, I would immediately fall off this really, really steep cliff that was a pain in the ass to climb back up again because, you know, I'm not climbing it on, on the nice little trail that's carved out. No, I'm climbing it, you know, straight up the face back up to the top again. So rather than losing it, right, spend the time chipping away a nice, easy trail from where you're at and walking back up to the top again. It's, it's a much better way to go. But th there's a specific thing that you have to do in order to keep yourself in line with this. Because if you're anywhere near jiu-jitsu, if you're, if you're near two people doing jiu-jitsu, you will want to do jiu-jitsu. You'll, you'll want to roll. You'll be like, oh, dude, dude I, I, come on, I can just get in a nice light roll. The next thing you know, you're injured again and you're out for at least another week, if not two. So, the way to go about it is this. Do not wear your gi top. Wear a hoodie. Because if you're, if you're in gi jiu-jitsu specifically, when they grab onto the hoodie, it's going to start to stretch and, and tear and whatnot. And, and you're, you cannot roll in the hoodie. You know? Now, you, you know gi guys, I'm sorry. You, you've already gotten rid of the... <laughs> <laughs> rid of the gi um but yeah I, I would imagine the same thing if you were to go in with a hoodie on you know and, and there's a couple reasons for this is like you're, you're not you're probably not going to be as active as you would be in class if you were continuing to roll right so if you wear a hoodie you will sweat more from whatever you do do and it, it'll also keep your temperature up and keep you sweating and that's that's really the thing is that you know, you, you lose the muscle really, really quick. And you lose the agility really, really quick. But I, I did get one compliment from the instructor though, while we were rolling. is He said, you kind of scared me there. Whenever, whenever you kind of really get rolling, you kind of scared me there. I, I, I definitely took the compliment to heart. Felt very good. Thank you, coach. Thank you, coach. <sighs> anyway, let's go ahead and throw down into some music. I'm feeling the need. You know, I got myself all jacked up thinking about jiu-jitsu. And, and, and really, it was probably like the, the most 
information packed and like fitness oriented that I mean because he had me gassed out like I I, I literally cardio tapped twice just because he kept, kept gassing me out you know and and it, it, it was causing me to reevaluate where I was holding my my grips you know because I, I I have a tendency to hold them too long you know whether it be with my legs or my arms and and that kind of thing can tire you out you know it's like as soon as it becomes non-viable you know you don't you don't have anything in the next position in mind that that particular grip is going to apply to let it go let it go transition to the next thing that you're working towards or that you were thinking about working towards but whatever you do i mean even if it's just pulling your arms back in you know and and guarding your neck and shit you know um that you you want to go ahead and disengage, disengage that that activity anyway as i said let's go ahead and get into some music and you know it's got to be body count and i'm not going to do the ski mask way <sighs> i've been seeing a lot of a lot of shit talking out there especially especially with as as the market has gotten where it's gotten a little cutthroat out there you know people starting to look at one another like prey starting to start up disinformation campaigns and whatnot and so here it is a little bit of body count talk shit get shot first dance here on coin metal And that was the contortionist with Thrive. Man, I really missed out. These guys were, uh, these guys were actually in the proximity that I could have reached if I would have had a ride and a pair of tickets. <sighs> Unfortunately, that did not occur, and I did miss out on getting to see them live in Portland. Oh well. Hopefully, there are. Uh, I'm sure there will be a, sh- a show that. I'll, I will catch in the future, um, but I, I, I imagine these guys put on a really good show, The Contortionist. Um, anywho, I got a few articles that I wanted to get into here, and um, let's see here, what was the first one? Here, and, and oddly enough, the uh, first couple articles that we're going to get into aren't even like cryptocurrency focused uh, news media, and they're not MSNBC, at least not the first two. Anyway, this first one's on Zero Hedge, the assassination of Bitcoin, I, and just the name caught me. I, I, I have to, I have to do it. Anyway, uh, this one's by uh, Tyler Durden. It was authored today, eleven twenty three two thousand eighteen, at fifteen or uh, seventeen hundred forty hours, so five o'clock p.m. somewhere. Thanks a lot, Tyler. Could have been more specific. Continuing on. As Bill reported last week, central banks are toying with the idea of launching a bank-backed cryptocurrency. Dan believes the outcome is all but assured. Only one thing stands in the way. Bitcoin. The collapse of Bitcoin, down 68, 68% year-to-date and 78% from its all-time high of $20,000 set in December of 2017 when it traded at $4,200.22 earlier this week, may have a perfectly normal explanation. It's a bubble that popped, or it's happened before and is nothing to worry about. As my colleagues have shown their readers in the last week, Bitcoin dropped 94% in 2010, 94% in 2011, 85% from 2013 to 2015, and 76% in the three-month period in the in a three-month period alone in 2013. Big price declines are are great buying opportunities, according to the bull case. In Bitcoin's case, any time the issue of a hard fork comes up, where a blockchain has to pass forward and goes in both directions at once, you've seen big price declines. But, Bitcoin has regrouped and rallied after each previous decline. It may do so this time as well. It may even be doing it as we speak. Each of the previous rallies from a from a crash low came as the public became more aware of Bitcoin. Awareness leads to liquidity and higher prices. 
This time around, for example, institutional interest in cryptocurrencies could be the catalyst for Bitcoin to double from from here and then double again and again if some of the crypto evangelists are right. Crashes, crashes and corrections are normal for cryptos, right? So fucking lootly they are. That, that wasn't in the article, that was my ad. Continuing. I'll leave the technical decision discussions to some of my colleagues who are more qualified to talk about them. They're important to understand if you're a long-term ho- holder, hodler, of cryptocurrencies. Today I'd like to suggest another explanation for the crypto swoon, the assassination of Bitcoin by global financial authorities. Why? Cryptocurrencies have proven that there is an appetite for both a cashless digital payment system and digital assets. What central bankers and the world's financial elite have figured out is that Bitcoin stands the way in in the new financial order, in the way of this new financial world order. It's an order where centrally controlled digital money promises complete political power over the lives and choices of billions of people. They're making their move to establish that order right now. Crypto evil. Crypto is the evil spawn of the global financial crisis. A coordinated assault on cryptos took place over three days last week. Over those three days, from November 13th to November 15th, Bitcoin broke through resistance at 63.30 and fell to 55.08 and then just kept falling. What happened, and in a moment, what happens next? <clears throat> the seven deadly paradoxes of cryptocurrency. The first broadside fired at Bitcoin came from Bank of England's blog, Bank Underground. Bitcoin is plagued by no less than seven fatal flaws, according to John Lewis of the Bank of England's research hub. Among these flaws is the fact that 97% of Bitcoins are held by less than 4% of addresses, creating a hoarding mentality that limits the liquidity of Bitcoin and its popularity as a payment option. Uh, That's not exactly what does it. Another Bitcoin can only process 7 transactions per second. Visa does 24,000 per second. That's actually not a not a bad thing. Continuing on. Another. Innovators who build on the foundation laid by Bitcoin will by definition improve and replace it. Not really. Its obsolescence and eventual destruction are the inevitable consequence of its conceptual success. Now, that's a complete misread. And yeah. Uh, what what a lot of people fail to realize, in, and we've covered this once before. This is, a, I think, it was a statement by Andreas Antonopoulos, and it was it was something to the effect of, you know, it doesn't matter how good the code is, it doesn't matter how good the devs are. What matters is, does the the miner double click on your exe and install it and run it? That that's what matters. So all of the all of the building on and all that other shit, you're you're building on quicksand. <laughs> you know, it's it's never made sense to me to transact abstractions representing volumes of Bitcoin when I can just as easily be transacting the Bitcoin itself. I mean Bitcoin is digital. I don't give a fuck if it takes me a couple hours to get my first confirmation. It's digital. And it's light years faster than any bank. You know, they, they take shit on credit. And, and they're, they're insured if it fails. We, we don't have that luxury. Your payment fails. Man, people are bitching. It's, it's losing you market share. We don't have that luxury here. You know, it's, it's something that people forget about the... Uh, the risk aspect of cryptocurrency. It's there's no guarantees here. Continuing on, another innovator. Oh, I'm sorry. Another innovators who build on the foundation laid by Bitcoin will, de- by definition, improve and replace it. No, they won't. <clears throat> its obsolescence and eventual destruction are inevitable. No, it's not. Of its conceptual success. No, you you trying to mimic it 
is is a uh, consequence of its conceptual success. Actual, act, and not not its conceptual success. It's real success. Bitcoin's been running for ten years. It's still running. You know, I, I don't know if you noticed that or not. Anyway, continuing on, the case for a new digital currency. So, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Central banks should create digital currencies and play a critical role in the global payment system, including the settlement of transactions, argued International Monetary Fund President Christine Lagarde in Singapore on November 14th. It was a subtle argument in its focus on potential public-slash-private partnerships between commercial banks and central banks. But... The important point is that Lagarde publicly floated the idea that central banks, not the private sector, should create and manage digital currencies. Centralization allows for control. Decentralization does not. Yeah, that's the fucking point. Continuing on. Evil Spawn. Bitcoin was a clever idea, but not a terribly good one. Worse, it was the, quote, evil spawn of the financial crisis of 2009, according to Benoit Curie from European Central Bank. Curie quoted Austin's Carstens, uh, Augustine Carstens, or Carstens, a general manager of the Bank for International Settlements, who called Bitcoin, quote, a combination of a bubble, a Ponzi scheme, and an environmental disaster. Yeah, whatever. That, that's what fudders usually say about your shit, especially if it's kicking their ass. Curier's speech called for further research into a central bank digital currency, but concluded it could be at least a decade away. <laughs> yeah, a decade more of us eating your lunch. Why the three pronged full frontal assault on Bitcoin right now? Because it's a threat. Because it's, a, because it's vulnerable to a lack of public trust, or because now it's a perfect opportunity. It's a combination of all three, but the last more important than the first two. First, true, Bitcoin was a response to the financial crash of 2009. It was a perfectly rational response to a system run by financial elites that holds your money captive, systematically destroys the purchasing power of your savings, and creates wealth-destroying booms and busts that are increasingly politically and socially destabilizing, and not, not to mention environmentally destabilizing. What fool wouldn't want to get their money out of a system like that? To the extent that cryptos could create a decentralized payment system currency asset class where trust is guaranteed by the blockchain, it's not guaranteed, it's verifiable by the blockchain. It's a kind of sound money, libertarian nirvana, uh, more like anarchist nirvana. But the flip side is that the moment that decentralized system becomes an actual threat to the money system controlled by central banks, the full might and power of sovereign states and central banks would come down on it. That's what's beginning to happen now. No, actually, that that's been happening for a little while, and I think they've kind of they've kind of resigned themselves to to us being being here, and, and so they've been kind of trying to mimic us instead of stamp us out. Continuing on, is Bitcoin vulnerable to a lack of public trust? It should be. <clears throat> Vast swaths of the public still don't know about or understand Bitcoin. The interest it has attracted in the last year is largely speculative. It's not people betting on new, dis disruptive technology or money system. It's people trying to make a quick buck from higher prices. And by the way, you still have to sell back into a fiat currency to make a buck, yen, pound, or euro. No, that's not true. You, you can make more Bitcoin by trading altcoins for it. That leaves the last possibility. Last week's attack on decentralized cryptocurrencies comes when the price action is bearish anyway. It also comes as central banks are ready to advance all the, all the benefits of a central bank digital currency. Central banks aim to capitalize on the budding popularity of cryptos and then harness it for their own ends. So what are their own ends? The war for control of digital money. 
The financial elite took its attack on cryptos to the front pages of the paper this week. Economist Nuriel Robini argued in The Guardian for a central bank digital currency that replaces the current payment system and the money creation function of commercial banking, although not the lending, which would be fully funded from 100% reserves. Bullshit. In Rubini's version of a central bank digital currency, CBDC, there is no blockchain technology at all. It's not scalable, cheap, or secure, he argues. And in his version, decentralized decentralization is to be avoided. Centralization is a desired and necessary feature for monetary control. Yeah, that's why we're not going to use it, fuckface. There's just one problem. What role do the banks play? You know, the banks that run Wall Street and control the Federal Reserve System. According to Rubini, emphasis added, is mine. Quote, the main problem with CBDCs is that they would disrupt the current fractional reserve system through which con- commercial banks create new money by lending out more than they hold in liquid deposits. Banks need deposits in order to make loans and investment decisions. If all private bank deposits were to be moved into CBDCs, then traditional banks would need to become, quote, loanable fund intermediaries, borrowing long-term funds to advance long-term loans such as mortgages. In other words, the fractional reserve banking system would be replaced by a narrow banking system administered mostly by the central bank. That would amount to a financial revolution one that would yield many benefits. Central banks would be in a much better position to control credit bubbles, stop bank runs, prevent maturity mismatches, and regulate risky credit slash lending decisions by private banks. (laughs) These fucking people have no idea what they're asking for. Continuing on. It's all about control. Cryptos and Bitcoin threaten that control. They have to go. Bitcoin gets knifed in the back by the IMF, SEC, NSA, and we get a digital money system where cash disappears and the authorities have full transparency into our monetary affairs. Our worst nightmare, in other words. (laughs) A forked road. We've come to a fork in the road for the money system since we were talking about forks. The traditional Wall Street money power controls the system because it's the quickest means to vast wealth, as Bill has shown in the diary the last few weeks. Control over money is sought for the purpose of wealth. The power of banks is to create money. I'm sorry, the power of banks to create money is important, but incidental to the goal, which is filthy lucre. By by the centralizing authoritarian status monsters, though, seeking seek control of money because their real goal is political power. This is the war on cash that Bill and others have written about for years. It is the systematic destruction of your ability to collect and hold wealth outside of the financial system. Killing the direct convertibility of the U.S. dollar to gold was one step. The various laws and regulations like civil asset forfeiture, which allow authorities to seize, quote, suspiciously large amounts of cash without due process, is another. The assassination of Bitcoin will be the next. It just so happens that the monetary system with the advent of technology and a cashless society is now the fastest, cheapest, and most thorough route to complete political power over the lives and political ch- uh, I'm sorry private choices of billions of people. Fractional reserve banking is a time-tested strategy for controlling money for the purposes of the acquisition and growth of large person- personal fortunes. But the issuance of a central bank-backed coin is an emergent ch- an emergent claim that the power over money should be centralized to nudge slash control slash coerce the population for its own for its own moral benefit betterment. <laughs> the Wall Street crowd could get completely blindsided by the DC crowd in the digital money war. Either way, ordinary Americans may be caught in the crossfire. 
the time to your pr- protect yourself is now. If, if history has shown us anything, it's that centralized authorities will do anything to maintain control over money. Does Bitcoin pose a threat to that control? I believe it does, but the assassination of Bitcoin will be just the first step. I believe a new type of money could be coming to America. The ultimate goal? To bring money in your wallet under the control of a central bank like the Federal Reserve. You may not want to believe that, but before you dismiss the possibility, get all the details right here and decide for yourself. And they give us a link even. And what's it say? Oh, yeah, whatever. This is an investment opportunity. Scare propaganda for selling shit. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I think uh, some of the points are um, are valid on this. Shitty store back <laughs> But uh, I wanted to go into the comments because these are usually the funniest part of, of these articles because they're like really spot on and usually. Anyway, continuing on, the first one is uh, the terrible sweel. Quote, Bitcoin dropped 94% in 2010, 94% in 2011, 85% from 2013 to 2015, 76% in a three-month period in t- alone in 2013. So it's a shitty store of value and therefore not functional as a currency. No, that's not true at all, but uh, it's a keen observation. <laughs> Next one is uh, Silver Shield. Silver is eternal wealth. Um, yeah. Uh, Quasi verbatim Bitcoin will fluctuate into nothingness, but real gold rolls on forever. Uh, Nature Boy Woohoo. Uh, but, gold, but gold is useless in the digital era. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> and uh, next one is uh, Jibji Research. Only the believers were, will hodl. Ha 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 ha. The crypto revolution is happening. Pick your side. <laughs> yeah, you know th- this isn't a um, a binary decision either, and and it's something that gets lost in a lot of these discussions. Is that it's not just between. You know, fiat and and uh, solid commodities, or fiat and cryptocurrencies and solid commodities, or I, I would have said Bitcoin in there was the the primary thing. But there are two thousand cryptocurrencies out there, and I, I don't even think I'm covering ICOs with that number. So again, it's not a binary decision. You know, if you if you don't like the way that a certain currency is being run, you don't like its governance model. You can choose one that doesn't have a bunch of assholes running it. You know that that's, and then it's just a matter of how much you want to support it. And one of the ways to indicate your support for a cryptocurrency is mining it. You don't have to mine it with ASICs or anything like that. You just have to show your support for the currency by supporting the network by being part of it. And that's in all of the articles. All of the articles that I read concerning cryptocurrencies, they never, ever, ever talk about them in terms of something that you participate in. You give it all value. You are the market. You are the invisible hand. And so am I. I am Satoshi Nakamoto. I am Janet Yellen. You know, all of these terms have been kind of leveled out. They're they're kind of equivalent now that we have these open source alternatives to centralized banking. Open source alternatives to centralized banking. Can, can you, like, internalize that? Open source alternatives to centralized banking. I mean, it's it's one thing when we're talking about the conversion of like video files and audio files and having an, an open source application that can do that. But this is an open source application that replaces the Federal Reserve, the central banking system. I mean, can, can you kind of grasp that? And more importantly, it's an open source project that you can participate in. Holy shit! I mean, there's never been anything like that. And, and you know when you when I watch my Twitter feed, I see the actions and reactions of everybody participating in it. 
And I can tell you right now, there's not enough of you participating in it, but that's okay. The participation is happening. It doesn't mean that you, you know, just because you didn't participate today, it doesn't mean you can't participate tomorrow. It's, it's ad hoc. It's at will. It's according to your will. You know, if you, if you prefer a more centralized cryptocurrency, there are some available. If you prefer a less, a less centralized cryptocurrency, there are plenty out there. But the, the importance of what they're talking about in this article is they're, they're covering it from a kind of a, uh, kind of an epithelial layer kind of, kind of concept here that they're talking about the action and flow of the transition between a, a world where you only had so many tools to convey your political will. And, you know, you, you buy um you buy Nike's instead of Reeboks not only because you know you you prefer the the feel of them you know you you just like the look of them a little more you know there's there's something to it that you value more it gives you a way to express your pre- your preference and then you hear that Nike does slave labor and you're like ah no I'm going to find somebody else that provides me a product that's just as good, it looks as good as Nike, but it's not produced by slave labor. That again is you expressing your political will. Now there are some that would wish to neutralize the cost to themselves by you doing this. <laughs> and, and they do that by you know buying up companies and whatnot. And and that's that's normal fair trade practice. But when you're talking about the tool that you have to buy all of these things and express your your political will and all that, <clears throat> the the tool has been U.S. dollars and has been like Visa cards that allow you to do it digitally and whatnot, or ATM cards that allow it to allow you to do it digitally, online accounts that allow you to do it digitally, but they're all controlled by a limited number of centralized entities and so like if at some time you were to deposit a significant amount of money into your account they they now have several pretexts where they can freeze those funds and say hey wait a minute we want to make sure you're not money laundering what these are all ways that they can then justify taking the money from you Now, when you talk about cryptocurrencies as an alternative to using this form of money, what you can do is say you have your your funds, either you're receiving them as money for for a good or service, or you're using them on on a uh, cryptocurrency exchange to potentially enrich yourself if you're a trader, right? And when you withdraw those funds, you don't withdraw them as U.S. dollars. You withdraw those funds as Dash, Monero, Verge, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Cash SV, Bitcoin Private. It doesn't matter. The, the, the point being that you can transition it straight into networks that don't have these controls over your money. You know, you could be receiving it directly to a cold address. You know, a, a you know a, a public address for a cold wallet, and and they're not the, the wiser on the other end. But they, and, you know, you got to keep in mind though that unless you have the keys, it's not your coin, and they may in fact say to you, "No, you can't withdraw to that because we don't do that," or or whatever. But that's that's one of the risks that you face by using cryptocurrency exchanges and or other intermediaries is that that's a choke point for your money. That's a point where you could be taxed, where you could be feed, where you can be anything, where somebody could give you less money than you're actually due. And so it's it's very important in this age. (laughs) <laughs> with these tools that you try and liberate yourself as much from that as possible 
you know, so if you can find a a, a decent wallet that that is lightweight for you to host or has the uh, has the storage profile that you're comfortable with, you know, you're willing to throw it throw a uh, a gigabyte or two disk drive to it, and, and or terabyte or or so, and just let it run. I mean, they're they're cheap enough these days that you know hosting a blockchain it, it's not as cumbersome as a lot of people think. Now, of course, syncing is a bit of a challenge, but that that's that's neither here nor there. You got to have better internet access. But that's that's another thing that I expect cryptocurrencies to improve, and I I've talked a little bit about about that on this show that I believe that's that's part of the evolution of mining that it's going to incentivize the development of infrastructure for both internet and electrical out to more remote regions and that's that's just going to improve life for everybody I think anyway let's go ahead and throw back down into some music and I hadn't had anything picked out but fortunately, I have a whole bunch of new stuff on here, so I have just plenty to pick from now. And let's see here. I, I heard a song off of this album playing, and I really wanted to play it again. And, you know, I haven't heard this song for, like, ever. And so here it is, Metallica, Fade to Black, here on Coin Metal. And that was Clutch with How to Shake Hands. <clears throat> it's off their new one, uh, Book of Bad Decisions. And uh, I, I picked this up, and I'll tell you what, man, it's a really, really neat presentation. The thing is huge. Like, when when I um, when I first received it, I thought it was like a... I, I thought I fucked up and, and uh, picked an LP because it was... The thing is so big. I mean, it could fit a... Um, it could fit an EP disc because it's it's big enough, but not not quite an LP disc. It's anyway, it's a CD anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, but the point is, is that it was a, it was a really nice presentation, some neat pictures, and and uh, of course all of the lyrics and stuff for all the songs. It's pretty cool. Uh, anywho, what we're going to dive into, I am. Um, I've been trying to communicate to people for a while now that there's an intrinsic relationship between activities that happen in the banking sector, such as, you know, quantitative easing or tightening or anything like that, and the price of cryptocurrencies. And this is this is still true. It's not, nothing has changed about this. And so uh, Considering what's going on with Bitcoin as far as the, the current price action and all that, got this one here on Bloomberg. Dollar funding squeeze set to get worse after basis swap blowout. This is by uh, Catherine Greefield, uh, November 21st, 2018, 4 a.m. PST, Upda- updated November 21st, 2018, or 2018 at 3 p.m. PST. Okay, so no, no penis. Dollar funding strains took center stage earlier than normal this year, and if the recent past is any guide, the worst, the worst of the squeeze is still yet to come. Further efforts by banks to shore up their balance sheets are likely to exacerbate a year-end shortage of the U.S. currency in the financial system, according to firms including Bank of America Corp. and TD Securities. That's even after three <coughs> a, a three-month cost to convert payments from euros into greenbacks using cross-currency basis swaps swelled in late last last September the most since 2009 as market participants sought to preempt what's now become an annual year-end crunch. The dash for dollars is set to reverberate across the globe, making it costlier for companies and banks from Europe to Japan to source the liquidity they need while affording investors with U.S. currency to spare the chance to turbocharge overseas returns. 
While few expect a repeat of last year when the bases blew out the widest in six years in the final weeks of December, it begs the question, just how can a world awash in trillions of dollars in greenback liquidity be running short again? Quote, Some of our traders see year-end funding levels continuing to show increasing signs of pressure, especially right around the turn said Mark Cabin, um, Cabana, my apologies, head of U.S. interest rate strategy of BFA. As LIBOR rates continue to widen, we think that we, I'm sorry, we think that would see similar funding pressures through, through cross-currency basis swaps. See. Investors can largely blame the Bas- Basel III regulatory regime adopted in 2014 for the seasonal rush for greenbacks. As a result of new capital requirements, global system- systematically important banks, or, C- or GSIBs, now tend to dramatically reduce their del- dollar lending activity in the closing weeks of the year, mostly in an effort to lower their surcharges. The result is that firms such as JP, JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and Morgan Stanley, among the world's largest lenders of dollars, are, holding, are hoarding greenbacks before they report their balance sheets. Quote, There's a real disincentive for some of the largest, uh, some of the biggest banks to lend out dollars over the turn of the year, said Grenady. Uh, Goldberg, senior U.S. rate strategist at TD Securities. Quote, It's a profitable trade for them to do throughout most of the year, but by the end of the year, they will in essence try to pair some of the activity to get more favorable regulatory treatment. Prior to 2014, abrupt widening episodes were primarily confined to periods of extreme risk aversion, such as in the 2008, such as in 2008, after the collapse of Lehman Brothers Holdings Inc., and in 2011, amid the eurozone debt crisis, funding frenzy. On the other side, foreigners have been left holding the bag. Multinationals are forced to pay up for routine business operations, such as hedging their FX exposure. However, or more, moreover, <laughs> overseas fun- firms tend to window dress their balance sheets too. That can be a costly undertaking given the proliferation of dollar-denominated debt overseas, according to P- Peter Cr- Caccini, yeah, Caccini, chief global market strategist at Cantor Fitzgerald. Quote, financial institutions in Europe need to covert euro denominated convert euro-denominated assets into dollars in order to match dollar-denominated assets and liabilities, Caccini said. In addition to banks, global bond investors are also feeling the strain. One consequence of the dollar shortage is that hedging costs become more expensive for European and Japanese investors. Benchmark 10-year Treasury yields have dwindled to minus 0.22% or 0.22% for yen-based buyers, protecting against currency swings. For European buyers, it's even worse at minus 0.35%, near the lowest this year. The sky-high hedging costs have have investors such as Bill Gates and Jeffrey Goodlatch suggesting that warning foreign demand, um, waning foreign demand for U.S. debt could help drive yields higher. Yet, for those willing to lend out their dollars, the surge in demand means that there's never been a better time to invest abroad. U.S.-based investors can lock in historically high returns in Europe and Japan after hedging their bond purchases, even though yields in the two markets are among the lowest in the developing world. Market Risks Signs of dollar demand are already cropping up elsewhere. The gap between the three-month London interbank offered rate and the overnight index swap rate, another gauge of global do- global dollar funding rates, has risen to 33 basis points from a low of 17 basis points last month. 
and the rates on the 30 and 90 day AA rated financial commercial paper continue to climb as issuance by foreign banks looking to secure funding over year end seemingly outstrips demand. Hmm. The December squeeze could be more painful than expected if the current turmoil in equity and oil markets worsens as U.S. trade tensions continue to linger. T.D. Goldberg says that the seasonal greenback shortage could potentially aggravate any bouts of risk aversion in which banks are wary of lending dollars. Quote, Let's say there's a shock event. There's an enormous risk-off move, and investors are scrambling for safe havens, trying to raise dollars to shore up their holdings, Goldberg said. It's ex an extremely diff difficult environment to do that. <clears throat> yeah. <sighs> so, you know, as far as I can read into this, this is what... This is one of those issues with having centralized banks in control of the money supply is that they can adjust the monetary volume in, in anywhere that they're servicing. It's like, oh, we want to loan these people more money, but we don't want to lend these people more money, you know? And they they adjust the rates accordingly to their their own concept of appreciation or return, basically. And, you know, I mean, it is it is in their interest to act in their best interest, but at the same time, it's costing somebody else. You know, there's, there's no free lunch. You know, everywhere that they're able to squeeze a little bit more out, that's less that's going somewhere else. You know, when you're, when you're printing up QE and it, it depreciates the value of your fiat currency per, per unit... That, that directly impacts everything that everybody buys with those units. And, you know, that's not one of those things that's going to be solved with a quote-unquote cryptocurrency being printed or issued by a centralized authority. You know, the, there's this idea that the pro there's a problem with cryptocurrencies and, and it's that we don't have kings and presidents and whatnot dictating to us what monetary policy should be and I, I think that's a uh, that's a big misread you know because the fact of the matter is is that this industry has been pretty pretty much self-propelled I mean there's there's been some institutional investment and there there has been VC funding but much more of the quote unquote VC funding is being crowdsourced from individuals such as yourself and me and that, that is an, a little bit different dynamic because those aren't funds that are, you know, somebody's retirement fund or something like that. And there's not a whole lot of choices to where the monies are actually dedicated. They're monies that you dedicate to a specific goal, to a specific project. And that, that's, a, that's a bit different because, again, it puts the control back into your hands and you're able to express your values through which currency you decide to transact your monetary value in. And this is this is a lesson of money. You know, it's it's been the same thing for for gold, for silver, for anything that we've used as an abstraction of value or a monetary vehicle where until we came out with with um, paper abstractions, and I, I I think that was a lesson that was learned a long time ago, and and there was from there a switch to specifically gold and silver, and then there wasn't enough gold and silver, and so we had to go back to abstractions of gold and silver, and then we severed the ties between gold and silver and the paper abstractions, and so now the paper abstractions are just supported by people's willingness to stick a gun in one another's faces. You know, that's pretty much it. But that's a, that's a value system that's that's not really projected towards ultimate growth, I think, because invariably you actually have to pull the trigger at one point or another, and every time you do, you lose more market share. And when I say that, I mean that that's like those are part of the market that you're bombing. Those are part of the market that you're shooting. You know, and while you might not have wanted them to 
be competing in previous iterations of our economy, we're coming into the type of economy where everybody can participate. If you can communicate with people, you can conduct commerce. And that changes the whole dynamic now. It reintroduces the idea of the human mind being the source of all resources. And now we're definitely going to be having to look up the, the production line of everything that we have around us and reevaluating what the actual value balance is. Because the participants aren't limited to a bunch of people up in Brooklyn or, or up in New York on, on Wall Street out, looking out and onto the world from their, their high up office. It's the people that live around the places where the ore is extracted out of the planet or the oil is drilled out of the planet or the forest is being cut down in the planet. And if they can communicate with the rest of the world... They can convey their market values. And it's a much different dynamic than, you know, again, somebody in New York trying to decide, you know, a wild, fish and wildlife policy or somebody in D.C. trying to determine fish and wildlife policy for some, some area 3,000 miles away that they don't have any affinity with. They don't have any loyalty to. They don't have any relationship with. You know, so they, they don't feel the direct impacts, you know, when somebody's bitching to them, no, don't put the fucking river into a bottle and sell it back to me because it impacts the environment around me. They don't really feel that. They But they do feel the $50,000 that's in their bank account because Nestle or somebody other's lobbyist came to them and said, hey, dude, vote this way and I'll give you a whole shit ton of money. You know, they, they feel that more directly. But, you know, when those people aren't the only sources of monetary value, when the sources of monetary value is some, some miner out in the middle of Montana loves nature way more than skyscrapers, and he's got a shit ton of monetary value in a cryptocurrency that nobody else knows he has, and he can come to you and say, Hey, guy, vote this way on this bill. Here's $50,000 in worth of a cryptocurrency that nobody else will know you have and think about that I mean what what's better for a, a politician than money that nobody else knows they have they can dedicate that to all kinds of little ventures that help them along some of them might actually even help you the constituency but only if you ask for it of course but anywho, yeah, that's that's basically what we're doing here in cryptocurrencies is allowing you other options to be expressing your political will. But of course, we haven't been treating cryptocurrencies as currencies. And so there's been a lot of a lot of fuckery because people misunderstand this this choice and this power that they now have. It's not been made clear enough to them, I think. And honestly, I believe that's because a lot of the talking heads that have been in front of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have not been stressing the fact that you are the network. You are the market. No you, no network, no market. That that's that's how this shit works. You know, they've been trying to convince you that it's like it's us. If there's no us, then there's no market. No, 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 no. You're just one little segment. The devs and whatnot, you're just one little segment. You present options of iterations of coins for us to run and, and mine. And if we don't like it, we won't run it. We, we, we won't mine it. But if we do, we will. And if it's good enough, enough people will use it that it can actually compete with the likes of Ethereum and Bitcoin and Monero and Verge and other coins that have been ex in existence for four years. But one of the things is you can't you can't look at it in terms of trying to force people to do things because invariably your your forms of coercion will be seen as detractors from utilizing your product and the more force you try to exert on people the less they are going to want to use your coin because it's evident that you've got a big ass cage in front of them and you're like trying to tempt them into the cage with a carrot or something like that you know it, but you know 
we're, we're, we're coming to the fact that there are plenty of cryptocurrencies out there that aren't cages. And so the, the choice then becomes, why crawl into a cage if you know it's a cage and that conditions can change? You know, they could be promising you the world up front, but conditions may change. You know, Bitcoin might not be over five figures and the ship might fall out of the bottom of the market for a little bit. And you might be left holding the bag for, for a substantial period of time. And if you're not prepared to do that, well, fuck, you're in the wrong game, kid. <laughs> you know, we're not going to we're not going to exchange the entire world world economy over to cryptocurrencies overnight. And to expect that we will is just silliness. And to expect that you're going to be able to force or coerce the, the market to act exactly as you wish is just action against yourself. Ultimately, you'll be burning old, your own ladders for later on. So it's good to keep the ladder down there, you know, just in case you fall off the top. Continuing on, I got this article here on uh, Coinspector, Coinspectator.com. Ethereum. Ethereum token hit by malicious gas token minting attack. And I want to refresh this just to find out how, how old this is. Uh, this is published 11 hours ago by Alexis. Um, no indication of penis or otherwise. No link to a profile, so we're just going to roll with it. An Ethereum vulnerability has been uncovered by Level K, a smart contract and Ethereum-based decentralized application developer that could easily allow, essentially allow an attacker to mint large amounts of gas tokens when receiving Ethereum. The vulnerability announced yesterday in a blog post was discovered last month on the 30th of October, but was just announced yesterday after Level K had made sufficient efforts to notify vulnerable parties, which are main, mainly cryptocurrency exchanges that affect transfers of Ethereum and Ethereum-based tokens, such as those based on the ERC-20 and ERC-721 standards. In explaining the vulnerability according to Level K, the vulnerability could be used in two ways to benefit, benefit a nefarious user. Quote, an attacker can perform computation in the fallback function of the contract that receives Ethereum from the exchange or in the transfer functionality of a token listed on the exchange. With the ability to make the exchange pay for large amounts of computation, an attacker can either drain the exchange's hot wallet simply by burning gas or mint gas tokens for a potential profit. Level K uses the following example excerpt. Quote, In the simplest exploit scenario, Alice runs an exchange which Bob wants to harm. In addition, if Bob also wants to make a profit, he can mint gas tokens in his fallback function and make money while causing Alice's wallet to drain. According to Level K, the warning was not, was not just directed at cryptocurrency exchanges, but also individuals who could be sending crypto to smart contract addresses without reading the contract code. In the blog post announced level, announcement, Level K had contacted a vast majority of cryptocurrency exchanges earlier last week to ensure that they had effi effectively patched the vulnerability before making the discovery public. By the time of the announcement, Level K reported that all of these exchanges had responded to the warning notification and patched the vulnerability. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so there you have it. And, and apparently, there's more to this article. Reading full here. Let's see where we were at in it, because uh, apparently that was like aggregate aggregated from another place. Okay, so they have patched the vulnerability supposedly. Yeah, <clears throat> I I think that's one of the dangers of building your stuff on top of other people's stuff. <laughs> Is that there, there's all kinds of little exploits that are endemic in them. You know, some of them are actually intentional. I, I'm one of the ones that I'm expecting to get hit, but not until it's actually worth a few billion is, um, oh, what's that one? Fucking Bancor. That one is, 
is just dodgy in my opinion. I mean, it just it seems like there were there too there were too many handles for abuse. Like the they could basically mint new coins on their own. They could change the volume that are out there, and, and I yeah I I didn't think that was a good thing. <laughs> I I think that if you're if you're going to offer up or make an offering that you need to be sticking to the parameters of your initial offering. And now, now there are certain not certain things that you could change, you know, such as like block size. I, I think that's something that you should be flexible on. And there are minimal trade-offs, but again, it depends on how big and how fast you're increasing the, the uh, volume capacity of your cryptocurrency. Like at this point, I think Bitcoin is is well known enough that if it were to have four to eight megabyte blocks, that there would be periods in which they wouldn't be filling the blocks entirely, but they would be able to address all of the traffic as it comes, and it would make it a much more effective payment payment means than some are wishing to make it. You know, I I have seen that. Uh, some lightning node implementation or another has been selling quite well. There, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that the interest is is certainly there for for that type of payment payment option. You know, the way to make Bitcoin basically back into what it still is and can be used as, but with an, another layer to it. You know, there's there's a lot of things that are just kind of like omitted when people are describing that whole whole system. You know, like the fact that it's all branched off of a side chain. You know, it's something to be taking into account. You know, especially when you're when you're spouting words like decentralized. Yeah, whatever. You're decentralized on somebody else's system. It's like you know you're using your mother's credit card. <laughs> you're decentralized, you know, you're you're not your mother, so you know, that that's cool. You know, you, you've got a layer of anonymity because everybody that that's on the credit card side thinks you're your mother. <laughs> you know, she she's just decided to to permit you to buy drugs on the dark web or some shit like that with her credit card. But the point being is it's still within somebody else's system. It's not as open and free as a lot of people have made it out to be. You know, and I, I saw some tweet about somebody trying to show his girlfriend how fast and easy it was to use cryptocurrencies. And uh, I guess they were buying dinner or something like that, and he ended up spacing his funds. Which... I, I thought it was kind of tragic, really. But he was trying to send it, send the funds from one wallet to a different type of, of wallet service that would facilitate the transaction with the vendor in question. And the whole problem with that, as far as I can tell, or as far as my feelings go, is that the intermediaries that the funds were being transferred to were completely unnecessary in cryptocurrencies. You know, meaning that the the guy that was in question, he could have ordered his food and probably had a first confirmation by the time he left his house and actually got to the restaurant and received his food. But because the vendor put this additional requirement on, oh no, you got you got to use BitPay. I I don't take cryptocurrencies except through BitPay. Fuck you. You don't take cryptocurrencies then. You're doing it the wrong way. You're inter- involving third-party intermediaries in transactions that do not require third-party intermediaries in order to facilitate or function. So you're doing it wrong. Don't blame it on me. I think that in the not-so-distant future, we are going to have a greater period of interest into cryptocurrencies that people are going to be feeling the stresses of these centralized payment systems that they are readily provided with and they are going to be looking for alternatives and here we will be in cryptocurrency land with thousands of cryptocurrencies existing and they might not even find one amongst those that fits their requirements and they might remember you know what 
all of this shit is open source. So like I could go back to a version of Bitcoin that I like. I could download the source code for it. I could update as I see fit and in the ways that I think have worked out well for altcoins and I can launch it. I could like, you know, pre-mine the first 10,000 coins and then tell the rest of the world, hey man, check this thing out. This is my, my alternative to Bitcoin. Please, line up some miners on it. Let's rock this world. And then then we're all back to square one with this thing. <laughs> I, I really think that we are due for all point, all bloom 2.0. The, the market isn't quite ripe for it yet, but I do expect that there's going to be a greater push for a greater need for mediums of exchange like cryptocurrencies. That people are going to feel the abuses of centralized banking and they're going to say, you know what, I'm done putting up with this bullshit. I'm going to put my, my monetary value into a vehicle that not only appreciates against my national fiat currency as a result of their policies, but in which I control, despite its digital nature, in a way that only banks used to be able to control my money. See, I think that if it's enough value for you to learn to use a vehicle to drive to and from work it's enough value for you to learn how to set up a computer so that you can transact your monetary value as you see fit especially because the technical requirements for both activities are, are pretty much even actually it's more difficult to drive a vehicle than it is to uh, set up a miner so with that in mind keep keep that in mind that the bar for entry and bar for participation has been low, lowered vastly and it's just up to you how you want to actually participate <sighs> should feel good to have that much responsibility and power let's go ahead and throw it back down into some music and you know I haven't been playing any cold chamber for a while but I feel the need and so here it is loco here on coin metal And that was 12 Foot Ninja with Coming For You. Yeah. And it is with that. We're kind of rounding out this episode. Getting to the end of the end of the end here. Nah. i just like to stress. You know, I keep I keep focusing on it because I really think that it is the, the focal point of this whole movement or technology or anything like that is that we are moving into a world where the trust the the trusted individuals that we've had in in currencies and banking and whatnot have kind of exceeded their their trust you know their ability to fulfill on that trust i think in many cases we've seen where malinvestment and uh, misappropriation has caused the growth of certain aspects of our economy or certain incentives in our economy um, that, as I said, are not able to fulfill on their initial promises. And uh, one, one place this readily comes to mind is like retirement funds. You know, the, uh, the fund managers assume that you're just going to continually be investing in them. And to some extent, it makes it kind of like a Ponzi scheme where they're guaranteed a certain level of income to some extent, some guarantee, right? So as long as the income coming in is exceeding the immediate exhale, the immediate demand, then then they're all right. But we're coming into a time when the demands on, on those funds are more than the money's coming in. And it's due to a lot of things. And one of those is the fact that we're coming into a much more efficient time with much more transparent systems than we've had available to us before. And so we are able now, and we will be greater more, you know, able to examine the costs associated with any particular endeavor and evaluate whether or not the volume of capital that's being invested is actually being appropriately invested. Meaning, are we getting value for our money? 
And in many cases, the third-party intermediaries that we've had available to us do not pencil out. The, the price differential between doing a transaction on-chain, on Bitcoin, even with the vast transaction fees that it has been inflated to at one point or another, um, even with that, it's still better off you're far better off doing your main transaction on on the Bitcoin blockchain than via these third-party intermediaries. The volume of trust issues that they impose on you, the volume of custodial, how should I say, authority that they apply to you and your funds, and the conditions that they place upon you are all intolerable by comparison to the open source systems that we make available in Bitcoin and others. Other cryptocurrencies, that is. And so when, when we're coming down to the actual evaluation, if those thousands of options are still available, you know, when the rest of the economy starts going Zimbabwe or Venezuela, that people are going to be looking at the balance sheets of all the values involved, and saying to themselves, you know, Dash provides me just as much security and just as much capability to transact monetary value securely as my bank does. But the volume of Dash that I have cannot be taken away from me by Dash. So, you know, that's, that's a plus mark, you know. I can determine the exchange rate that I'm willing to exchange with somebody else with cryptocurrencies. I could say to them, this is the current market value for cryptocurrency that we're going to transact in, but I expect a small bump in the near future. So, if you would be willing to forego a little bit of that profit right now and give me a discount on this thing, you know, we can do business. You know, I value this cryptocurrency because I know in the future it is going to go up in relative value to the U.S. dollar. So, I wish to do a slightly higher than today's market rate exchange with you using this currency. And if you understand my position on it, if you're looking at the chart and you're saying, oh yeah, you know, I'm seeing that there is an increase in interest in using this cryptocurrency. And so I, I can see where there's a potential for me to make even more than this differential that you're proposing. And in the not so distant future, within a tolerable time frame, suddenly it's advantageous for me to take this offer now because I can look at the chart and say, you know, according to my, my risk aversion and according to my, my, uh, personal interests, it would be advantageous to do this transaction at this time. At these current ex- these conditions that you're proposing. And that has reverberations through the market. What doesn't have reverberations through the market is when you're willing to exchange your cryptocurrency for something synthetic, like a stable coin where there is a supposed relationship with an actual volume of U.S. dollars that you're trading against. But there is no way to guarantee that the volume actually matches the outstanding number of units. They can tell you and they can provide you plenty of metrics that that give you a graphic user interface that show you that that's the case. But as far as the rest of the market is feeling it, it, it doesn't know that that transaction happened. Because it, it, the, the transaction itself isn't really impacting the fiat market. It's not changing the amount of U.S. dollars that are circulating in the market. It's changing the amount of Tether or USDC that's circulating in the market. Not U.S. dollars versus cryptocurrencies. So it's, it's something to keep in mind, especially when we're talking about making abstractions on the other side like liquid bitcoin or tokens of various orders you know these are abstractions of value meant to represent another cryptocurrency or another another fiat currency or another commodity with again no intrinsic link between the two other than 
the volumes being paired on a supposed blockchain that you don't have con control over because you can't mine it. And there you have it. And so, yeah, it is with that that I'd like to close out this episode. Thank you very, very much for listening. I certainly do appreciate the support. You can always find me on Twitter under Frank Dashwood or DJ Erock23. Also on Facebook, YouTube, and in the Discord chat room for Verge Currency and the Telegram room for the same. And so, we will be back again on Monday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so, until then, I want you all to trade safe. Do your homework and watch out for your own bunghole because nobody's going <laughs> to nobody's gonna do it for you. Thank you again for listening and you all have an excellent weekend. Last Dance, Static X, Cannibal, here on Coin Metal. Thank you again and you have a great night.